Imperial Yeast has been up to some interesting things lately, and they recently announced a product we are super excited about. If you're familiar with Imperial Yeast, you're likely aware of their classification system. A is for ale as an AO7 flagship, L is for lager as an L17 harvest, and so on. Well, they recently released the first strain in their I series, which stands for Imperialis and refers to non-GMO hybrids or derivative yeast strains developed by Imperial Yeast that have been honed to exhibit the traits today's brewers most desire. The initial offering, I-22 Capri, is a high hybrid of A38 Juice and A43 Loki, two of Imperial's most popular strains for Hop Forward IPA. Whether you're into this style or just enjoy juicier fermentation characteristics, you have got to try I-22 Capri. Learn more about the Imperialis Project and I-22 Capri at imperialyeast.com. There are numerous points in the brewing process at which bad things can happen, one of which is exposure to oxygen, which is primarily an issue once fermentation is complete, namely during the packaging process. While many brewers rely on mechanical methods for reducing the risk of cold side oxidation, the use of chemical antioxidants has been getting more focus lately. This is the Brewlosophy Podcast. I'm your host, Marshall Schott, and joining me on this episode to discuss the use of sulfites at the point of kegging is contributor Andy Carter. I think we've said it enough. I think we've said it a lot. Cold side oxidation is your enemy. We've known this for a long time, especially brewlosophy. What is really interesting about it is using sulfites, which I'd only ever heard of using in winemaking. When it comes to beer, honestly, I thought this was a game changer when I heard about it because it's so simple. It's so easy. It's so straightforward. And yeah. I can't wait to talk about it more. It's really fascinating stuff. Yeah, You know, I've been brewing for nearly two decades at this point, And it seems to me that talk of using sulfites in beer has really only been going on for, I, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong here, Andy, for the last four or five years, maybe. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. I think that's about four or five years. Yeah. Yeah. My, my, by my recollection, uh, we have the Lodo, the low oxygen brewing folks to thank for that. They really did kind of blast this, the use of these sulfites. At least that's my memory of it uh, in brewing, at least. Uh, they, they're the ones who kind of put, seem to have put that on the scene. Uh, um, however, you know, whereas their focus was largely on treating the brewing liquor prior to the mash as a way to remove dissolved oxygen, uh, more and more people have been using sulfites to reduce cold side oxidation uh, caused by oxygen exposure that happens at the time of packaging. Pretty cool stuff. Now, in this episode, we will be talking about some generals of using sulfites in packaging, uh, you know, altogether, uh, though we are going to be focusing more on the differences between the, the two main sources of sulfite for brewers, and that's sodium metabisulfite and potassium metabisulfite. I'm really looking forward to this one. All right, if you're a fan of this show and you'd like to receive a reward for your support, consider becoming a patron of Brewlosophy over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy, uh, where you make a small pledge and receive rewards like access to unpublished contributor recipes, unique discounts at yakimavalleyhops.com, and an invitation to a monthly live Q&A session with somebody in the brewing world. I get asked all the time, so for those who are curious, the YVH discount this month is for $6 off every one pound bag of fresh 2022 Australian Eclipse, so for a five dollar pledge you get a six dollar off or a six dollar discount off of some really awesome hops uh, our special guest this uh, this month for the q a session will be short-circuited brewer brian huntley who has a great youtube channel and blog where he covers all things electric brewing as well as more general brewing related topics uh, to be a part of this session you have to make your pledge at patreon.com slash brewlosophy by friday september 23rd 2022 as brian's going to be hanging out on saturday the 24th all past sessions are stored on both our private patreon and facebook pages so patreon can go back and watch them whenever they like. Again, that's patreon.com slash brewlosophy. And if you wouldn't mind letting us know what you think about this show by leaving a rating and review an Apple podcast or wherever it is you listen to podcasts, we really would appreciate it for just a minute or so of your time. Not only do you make finding this show easier for those who may not have heard of it, but we get to know a little bit more about what you think about the show. All right. Feedback is brought to you by Clawhammer Supply, who in addition to having a remarkable YouTube channel chock full of great brewing related content, sell what we believe to be some of the best electric brewing systems on the market. Uh, if you've been considering making the move from propane to electric, you owe it to yourself to check out Claw Hammer Supply. Uh, whether you're after a 120 volt 5 gallon unit or something bigger like their powerful 240 volt 10 gallon system, Claw Hammer has got you covered. Learn more about everything they have to offer at clawhammersupply.com and don't forget to check out their YouTube channel as well. Listener and Brewlosophy patron Tom Lopez had some feedback for us after listening to episode 246 where we talked about wort dilution. Tom said, I really enjoyed this episode. As someone who brews on a small batch system, 
system. It never occurred to me to use this method as a way to increase my batch size. And the tip about adding chilled water to kill two birds with one stone, mind equals blown. <laughs> I was reading an article in Zymergy in which the author described brewing a Belgian triple where the candy sugar was added a couple days into fermentation and a light bulb went off in my head. Is this a common method used when fermentation, uh, when fermenting high OG beers to obviate the need for a yeast starter? I haven't heard of this, but it makes sense. Starters are made to increase yeast count, uh, but a couple days into fermentation, the yeast count would be much higher than that uh, than at the time of pitching. So at the time, the yeast could ha- at that time the yeast could handle the additional sugars. I'm aware this is a pretty similar to your uh, previous experiments regarding the staggered sugar additions to Belgian ales, uh, but I think for those both batches uh, had a sufficient number of yeast cells pitched at the beginning of fermentation. I'm all about simplifying my brew day, and while yeast starters aren't horrible to make, you do have to plan ahead, and it does take some time. Plus, I always get paranoid about the increased risk of contamination. Dumping sugar into the fermenter two days into fermentation sounds way easier and less risky to me. Hundred uh, percent, maybe not, maybe even two hundred percent right. It's so necessary to make enough yeast cells, but you're right. When it's a few days into fermentation, there's more than enough yeast cells. They're they're actually better off getting sh- uh, glucose, you know, pure sugar later because they want to consume maltose. And if they get addicted or you know a little bit of glucose, they kind of start going that direction. It's also interesting. I won't name any names, but some fairly high profile craft breweries do this too to raise the alcohol content of their beers they start at six percent then go to eight or nine percent so this is not an uncommon technique um you could use it to do you know like we said we know in the dilution experiment uh you know we said do it this way to chill add the chilled water or you know hey if it's really small like you made a four percent beer oh i want to make it five or six percent a little bit of sugar is not going to really impact the beer i mean we could even do an experiment to that regard you know we've done some things with sugar and staggered nutrient additions you know we find that you know in general generally speaking alcohol it's hard to perceive a one or two percent change in alcohol sometimes i mean more than that or depending on the the base strength, yes, you can, or yeah. you, theoretically you can, right? But, you know, this is a great thing. And these are little little tweaks, little things you can do that, you know, craft brewers, they do it sometimes, but you have that flexibility at the small size for home brewing. Yeah, you know, uh, I am not one to give advice. I it, Maybe it's my training as a clinical psychologist, I don't know, but I, I don't like to recommend that people do specific things because then, <laughs> then if it doesn't work for them, you are partially responsible for that. So I'm not comfortable recommending that people skip yeast starters when making Belgian ale simply by adding the sugar during fermentation. But but, but it's certainly one way to reduce the initial stress on the yeast, like you mentioned, Tom. Uh, so if you if you know you're going to be under pitching when all of that sugar is present in the wort, I do believe that you know moving those sugar additions later on in the process is probably a smart idea. Kind of like you mentioned, Andy, you are uh, basically what you're doing then is feeding the yeast, and I think that's the term they use. Is yes, you know you're you're, you're you want to gradually feed that yeast, you stagger it so that you are not stressing the yeast out. And one of the benefits besides the the reduction in potential for off flavor production. Uh, is that that yeast is is already eating so you're feeding it and it's not you're not stressing it out so that it actually does still ferment all of that sugar uh over time as opposed to it all being added at, at you know at one point so thanks for the feedback and support tom uh we really appreciate it if you have show feedback you could send it to feedback at brewlosophy.com or drop us a note on social media hey real quick do you uh, do yourself a huge favor do us a huge favor by searching for brewlosophy on youtube and subscribing to our channel we're going to be making an exciting announcement soon i can't say much yet uh, but i think you'll be as stoked as we are. Uh, one thing to note for those who currently listen to this show or the Brew Lab podcast on YouTube, I know it's not many of you, a few hundred people per month probably, we will soon be removing both uh, both of the, the our podcasts, the Brewlosophy podcast and the Brew Lab from YouTube as a platform. We apologize for any inconvenience this may cause, but ultimately it has to be done to make room for what's to come. When we're back from this break, our focus will be on using sodium and potassium metabisulfite when kegging beer. Chilling work can be a chore, especially after a long brew day, but not with the Exchillerator Counterflow Chiller, which can chill a 5-gallon or 19-liter batch of wort in 5 minutes or less, leading to a strong cold break and clear wort in the fermenter. Brulosophy's Matt Del Fiaco uses the Exchillerator Max and absolutely loves it. In addition to improved chilling efficiency, every Exchillerator comes with a 5-year warranty that covers the entire chiller for manufacturer defects. If you're looking to up your chilling game and a CFC is right for you, head over to Exchillerator.com today. 
As every brewer knows, the best beer requires the best hops, which Yakima Valley Hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world, carrying everything from classics like Cascade to modern favorites like Galaxy and Mosaic, as well as other ingredients and gear, Yakima Valley Hops has it all. And don't forget to check out their new podcast, The Late Edition, where the YVH crew goes into depth on our favorite plant with industry experts. Head over to yakimavalleyhops.com now to see all they have to offer and subscribe to The Late Edition wherever it is you listen to podcasts. There's no denying that stainless steel is the best material for brewing equipment, and Delta Brewing Systems offers some of the lowest prices on high-quality stainless gear, like the Firm Tank, which in addition to holding 8 gallons or 30 liters of work, comes with a domed lid to even further reduce the chances of a messy blow-off. Plus, it can hold up to 4 PSI of pressure for closed transfers. Delta Brewing Systems also has their own line of brew kettles, as well as one of the lowest-priced all-in-one electric brewing systems out there, and their prices are shockingly low. If you're in the market for legit stainless gear that won't break the bank, do yourself a favor and head over to DeltaBrewingSystems.com today. Someone recently asked me what in my approach and perspectives on brewing has changed the most since I started brewing nearly 20 years ago. My response was immediate. Be mindful of cold side oxidation. For the first 13 or so years that I was brewing, I did little to avoid exposing my beer to oxygen. I mean, I wasn't intentionally splashing it around. I was trying to be careful, but that, that's about it. Uh, I wasn't anywhere near as careful uh, as I am today when it comes to the packaging process. Well, one tool that seems to be getting more attention from brewers lately for its ability to reduce the impact of cold side oxygen exposure is sulfites. Yeah, so a sulfite is a usually it's a part of a as a salt. It's a part of something else, you know. So we use, uh, you know, Epsom salt or uh, chlorine, uh, uh, you know, uh, sodium chloride or you know anything like that in brewing salt. So two parts, but so the sulfite ion that's a part of something else. So we usually talk about this in two forms. Really, it's only available in two forms for home brewers or winemakers: is sodium metabisulfite or potassium metabisulfite. Right, and we'll get to the differences in a little bit. Um, usually, you typically this is used as a sterilizer or something on the on the order of a sterilizer it's not going to kill things necessarily so there's some debate as to how the mechanisms between how it works with yeast but yeah. yeast or yeast or bacteria but you know some type of neutralizer let's say neutralizer of of a microbacteria microbacteria and a, antioxidant yeah so how does it work as a sterilizer let's we'll start with that we mix it into the liquid it forms sulfur dioxide or so2 which is a disinfectant it's a common disinfectant in a lot of different uh, production stuff the, the the problem with that is disinfectant is quite smelly right <laughs> so there's a little bit of issues there with it, especially with noxious fumes and especially in closed areas what's it smell like andy it smells like rotten eggs it really does it smells like rotten <laughs> <Yeah>. eggs. <laughs> Uh, so known disinfectant uh, inhibits the growth of wild microbes and halts activity, but it's not like a killer, right? So there's like, you know, if you want to kill something, you want to stop, you, know, you have to heat is your best source, right? It's the simplest, yeah. it's the best. You know, there's chemicals, of course, but you know, it's, it's a little, this, you should remember just as a, just a thing, we're not going to talk a lot about sterilization or neutralization today, but just as a, just as a put in your head, it's not something that's going to destroy the yeast, right? It's not going to rip it apart like a, like boiling or some type of harsh acid would. So, yeah. You know, I think that's an important point. We get the question. In fact, I think we answered it on a recent uh, some uh, feedback, or maybe it was on the recent uh, Brew and A. But uh, you know, hey, if I if I want to use uh, I bottle condition, and if I want to, we're going to talk about this later. But I, I want to use sodium metabisulfite for scrubbing oxygen. Is it going to impact the ability for that beer to carbonate because it's going to knock the yeast out? The amounts that you use for both of those purposes is vastly different. It really is. Um, I use uh, metabi. I use sodium and or potassium metabisulfite. I actually don't care which one, <laughs> but what's whatever I have on hand, which is usually both. Uh, but when I'm making cider uh, for sterilization purposes, so I always back sweeten my hard cider with, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll back sweeten it with canned uh, apple juice concentrate. I might use, uh, you know, mushed up mango or something like that. Well, that is all fermentable, but I want that. I want those sugars to be in the cider so that I can taste that sweetness. So what I'll do to knock the yeast out or to inhibit the fer the, the re fermentation of that added sugar is add a decent amount of metabisulfite. When I'm doing that, the amount I'm adding is is on the level of maybe like 12 grams, 15 grams. It's basically like a teaspoon. Uh, when I'm adding it for the purposes of uh, antioxid antioxidation to reduce the risk of oxidation, it is like a, you could put, dip your finger in it and blow over it. I mean, it is less than a gram, right? Yeah. Um, and so just to keep in mind that when, you know, people, I understand the confusion, um, but when you are using it for the oxygen purposes, you are not using 
And, and there are anecdotes out there of people will tell you that, that we're not wrong here. You're not using anywhere near enough to make it so that the yeast will not re-ferment sugar that you add back. So don't think that it's a, you know, it's an all-in-one. This, is, this stuff is crazy useful. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it serves so many purposes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just you got to be mindful of what you're using it for because that's going to dictate the amount of the stuff that you end up using. Absolutely. So to get to the point of this episode, there's a few other ways. And actually, it's so so funny when you learn about sul- uh, beta bisulfite, how many uses it really has. It's actually quite, quite crazy. Fascinating. It's crazy. Uh, but the use, yeah. will, will use, use we'll talk about, it, yeah, the real primary thing we're talking about is antioxidants. So when added to a liquid, so you add it to water, mix it up with water, or just to beer itself, you know, a redox reaction or reduction oxidation reaction occurs where the sulfide ion binds with oxygen present in the solution, reducing the amount of re- re- reducing the oxygen that's in solution, right? So say you have a beer, say you carb, say it's, uh, you're about to package it, you know, you're going to put it into a keg it's basically at zero because yeast has consumed all the oxygen in the vessel right and let's assume it's a perfectly sealed vessel right you've opened it up to air it's not open fermentation something like that right it's sealed it has virtually no oxygen when you move it you know moving is going to create turbulence any air it's going to touch the beer especially when you use a racking cane that's very narrow mm-hmm. high, very high surface area to volume ratio oxygen is going to get in that's why we espouse all CO2 all the time when you keg, especially for like hoppy beers or something that's very sensitive, yeah. is that you're going to take a keg. We want to, I, what I do is I'll just go over my process real quick to, to kind of you know give a comparison to this. And maybe, Marshall, you can say, I think you have a similar process. Is mm-hmm. You take a keg, you fill it full of sanitizer, you pump out the sanitizer with CO2, or in your case, you've done the uh, brew lock, the you know the pump with active fermentation <laughs> CO2 to pump CO2 out of it. Keg, keg jumping, a fantastic, amazing, and cheap. great process. <laughs> yeah. And cheap, yeah. and cheap. It's free. CO2 is coming off free. Um, you got that CO2, and then that's going to empty the keg, keep it completely purged, and then you rack into that keg with head pressure that is CO2 into whatever vessel you're pumping from, whether it right. be a fermenta- fermenter, uh, a uh, conical, what have you, right? So close, transfer, low oxygen. But you're going to always get some. So this is like another thing, another level above that is, okay, any little bit of oxygen is going to there. Let's remove it completely by adding this, which would be the small amounts of sulfite. It's yeah. Great. Great. It's a, it's a, it makes, it makes sense end to end in terms of how this would work for this process. Yeah. And using it in the way that you said, so that the, the, what you outlined is what I refer to as mechanical, uh, a mechanical method for reducing uh, oxygen exposure. You've got kegs, you've got a, you know, a CO2 tank, you're pumping that CO2 in rather than oxygen entering the, the vessel, you're pumping CO2 to push that beer, which ostensibly hasn't had access to oxygen since the yeast was pitched. Uh, you know, you pump it out into a keg that's already been purged uh, in that. I, I know a lot of people, these days, quite a few actually, who are doing that and then also adding this small amount of sulfites just as insurance because you really do not, especially with hazy IPA, pretty much anything dry hopped actually, seems to be highly sensitive to oxidation. So so every measure that you can you can take to ensure that it doesn't, you know, that, that you are increasing that shelf life, that that beer is going to taste fresh for longer, a lot of people are doing. This chemical side, you can actually use it without the mechanical stuff. We've done some experiments on that you can go back and look at, but it's fast fascinating how well it seems to work. I mean, we'll just put it that way, uh, that this tiny amount of this, this, this powder, this compound that has sulfide in it can be added to a keg and you rack a beer into it. And lo and behold, your, your, your risk of oxidation is significantly notably, you know, decreased. Now, before we start breaking down the differences between sodium and potassium metabisulfite and going into the kind of geeky stuff there, uh, I do think it's important to point out there are other uses for this crazy, uh, 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 you know, kind of, uh, it's, it's certainly not a one trick pony. We'll put it that way. Uh, sulfites are also used if you have if you have high chlorine or high chloramine water, you add Campton tablets. Campton tablets are sodium metabisulfite. That's all it is. Or you uh, you can buy K meta, I think it's called, which is potassium mm-hmm. metabisulfite. Um, it, you, you add a little bit of that stuff to your brewing water, you know, a few hours before you brew and it'll knock all of the chlorine and the chlorine out. So there's another use for it. I mean, when I heard about this, I was like, are you kidding me? This is amazing, right? Because this is one thing like chloramine is so hard to remove from water and here's your solution. Boom. Yeah. Done. And it works. Right. I, it's, it's, it works. It's yeah. fantastic. I actually, um, so I, my, I'm lucky because the water that I get at my house is low chlorine. I've talked about this many times before. Uh, it's very low chlorine. We don't use chloramines in, in our municipal system. So uh, I was, I was, I think I told this story recently, but I'll repeat it because it's relevant. Uh, I, you know, I was, um, 
I was brewing one time and or for, for a while and I had been making these beers and a friend of mine was like, dude, you're starting to develop a house flavor. He thought it might be uh, me reusing yeast. <laughs> so I got new yeast and I still had this flavor. It wasn't bad. It was just a house thing that I didn't want. I wanted more control. Uh, so that's when I decided to try out, well, let me just see what happens. Even though I know my, chlor- my, my chlorine levels are low in my, my tap water and I filter my water and do all that. Let me just try treating it with a little bit of Campton. Sure enough, uh, that, that house flavor went right away. <laughs> so that tiny little amount of of chlorine, you can't even smell it in my water. Removing it did seem to have an impact for me in my brewing. This stuff is just so useful to have in your brewery. And I know that there are people who are allergic to sulfites and I get it. You can't use it. You got to let those people know if you are using it. But for those of us who aren't, man, it's just so useful. I've been not using it too much in my brewing because I just haven't had the, um, I've just used all the transfers. I haven't seen it, but I, but I know my experiments, you know, it makes sense, right? So it's kind of one of these things where if you can't measure it directly, like a blind triangle touch something, but you still know it's going to help. There's actually no downside. I've been using more and more of it during my brewing. So yeah. Yeah. I'm a big fan. Fortunately for me, you know, I don't have, I, I tend to buy RO water directly, but if I had to use water, you know, let's just say I did a carbon filter it um, or some type of filtration to get rid of like the really nasty, the really volatile stuff. But I knew chlor- chloramine was around. I would do that. I guess the problem would be like, you know, you have a filter, you might destroy your, might hurt your filter a lot with chloramine. I've heard different things, but just keep it in mind that this is a useful way of removing uh, the chlorine type products from your water. Yeah. Uh, one other, I think I already mentioned it before, but if when you're looking at the way the, the Lodo or the low oxygen brewing folks use this stuff, they're, they're treating their water from the very beginning. So that water is going into the mash. And then the idea there is that it's going to reduce oxygen exposure uh, on the hot side as well, which is a big focus for them. So it, again, multiple uses for this crazy stuff and it's hella cheap. So you can go pick some up, you buy a pound, you're going to have it probably for the rest of your brewing career. So now yeah. we're again, we're going to break down the difference between sodium and potassium metabisulfite. There maybe are some listeners out there who didn't even know there was a difference. Uh, but let's c- real quick talk about using this stuff. Again, sulfites always come as a salt, which means that they are a compound with something else. Uh, and the two that we use are SMB and PMB. So when you're using sulfites to reduce the, the risk of cold side oxidation at packaging, uh, in that, in that uh, use, you are going, you're aiming for about 10 ppm of sulfite altogether per five gallons or 19 liters of beer. Is that correct? That is what I've been basing mine off of. Uh, Andy and and I, I believe that's what Jake was telling me uh, when we first started doing this stuff. Yeah, so that, uh, when I started doing my experiments with it, I started reading the Lodo Lodo Brewing because that made sense, right? Those are the guys that have the numbers on it. And yeah, ten ppm, which is like nothing compared nothing. to the stuff you would use for sanitizer. I was measured, you know, less than less than a gram per five gallons it is so little, and it's you know we're talking on the orders of. of fifth of a gram 0.0.2 <laughs> grams to yeah. get 10 pp b 10 ppm in a five gallon batch i mean it's nothing and you know that's it's it is something where it's interesting and usually we have books and typically in brewing you know there's these old texts these old tomes that have a lot of details a lot of a lot of uh i would say history right and uh, uh, unfortunately fortunately or unfortunately a lot of the sulfite stuff is actually relatively new for brewing right we've only talked about it last week we said four or five years there's some in winemaking too but not about oxygen so it is kind of a new area i would say you know, arguably a new area so there's not a lot of reference there's not a lot of citation yeah. but you know this is the kind of rule of them we're playing with right now and it seems to work for both them and for our and our purposes too so yeah, well, and I'll tell you, there is a lot of stuff on the internet these days about people using sulfites for this purpose, and that 10 ppm mark seems to be working perfectly for a lot of people. Uh, I've talked to professional brewers, you know, smaller, smaller scale professional brewers who are doing the same thing at packaging. Uh, I believe they do have to list in the U.S. They have to list that they're using sulfites uh, f- for that purposes. But, uh, but yeah, it, it, you, it, you're not using anything. I mean, it is literally measuring it out is a pain in the butt to be honest. I, I, you know, because it's so it's such a small amount of this powder. Uh, that you're adding to your keg. Now, if you are purging kegs prior to using the beer or prior to using, uh, uh, you know, you're purging the kegs prior to adding the sulfites, you do have to be careful about that. You don't want to introduce too much oxygen to the keg. Again, in that case, you're using it more as a prophylactic, in, you know, in my opinion, uh, but it, but it's just added measure. If you're not purging your keg, you can just sprinkle the powder to the bottom of the keg and rack on top of that. We've been able to show that that does seem to have an impact as well, which is really cool. If you're bottle conditioning, all you have to do is when you're racking that beer in, if you are using a bottling bucket, add add the uh, the sulfite, whatever source that you you choose, add it to your uh, bottling bucket. 
and then rack the beer on top of that. It'll get nice and mixed up and then immediately bottle from there and you should be good to go. Now, uh, it can also be added to the beer. Uh, it, uh, like I said, it can be added to the beer uh, once fermentation is complete in the fermenter if you want as well. I just think it's safer probably to add it to the either bottling bucket or to the keg. Now, we talked a little bit about bottle conditioning before. I don't think you have anything to worry about if you're bottle conditioning with this tiny amount of sulfites, but it should still help with the oxygen scrubbing. I think it would be a really interesting experiment to do a non-purged keg but sulfite added versus a bottle conditioned one that where the sulfites are added to see if there's uh, you know, a difference in shelf life or a difference in overall stability. I, I, personally, I think that'd be pretty interesting. So this is really interesting because what's been known for a long time, especially before kegging was in home brewing, was bottle conditioning was the de facto way of removing all the oxygen from a beer. It's a great way of storing beers for a long time. <laughs> to the point, Sierra Nevada, probably the best technical brewery in the United States, right? The longest, so good, yeah. 1980, from beginning, right? They still bottle condition Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. That means they know something's going on, right? They know that this is a very good way of removing oxygen from beer. So it'd be really interesting to say, hey, is this beer different? You know, like we said, we don't believe the yeast is going to stop at all, but it is a way of removing oxygen compared to removing it chemically with sulfite. So I think that's a really cool idea. I actually might just fire that one off myself. So. That'd be awesome. Yeah, I would love to see that. All right, now to break down what, what the purpose of this episode really is, is to the comparison between sodium and potassium metabisulfite. Again, both are metabisulfite. One has a sodium ion, the other has a potassium ion. That is really the only difference. Uh, the chemical formula for sodium metabisulfite is Na2S2O5. Uh, the chemical formula for potassium metabisulfite is K2S2O5. As you can see, it is the only difference is that sodium or that potassium ion. Now, mm -hmm. uh, there, there is a slight difference. So this is actually something I only learned when you did the experiment we're going to be talking about in a minute, mm -hmm. Andy, is that sodium metabisulfite has a slightly higher concentration of sulfites than potassium metabisulfite, which henceforth I'll be referring to as SMB and PMB because my tongue is getting tired. Uh, so, so less is needed, but it's really not by that much, right? Yeah, yeah. So basically, if you go to chem take chemistry, it's, you know about moles and how many, you know, Avogadro's number is that things weigh something because the amount of uh, constituent atoms that are in the thing, right? So you see SMB Na2SO, Na2S2O5 versus K2S2O5. So those, you know, molecules, they themselves have a different density, right? So when you measure them on a scale, the number of grams, that's a number, it goes back to a number of moles. And so, you know, you use quote unquote less, though you're getting the same amount ppm of sulfur if that makes sense so that's right. why it is but like we said this is fractions of a gram <laughs> no one's breaking the bank on uh, a five gallon batch of uh using metabisulfites so yeah and and like you mentioned earlier that our 10 ppm goal is just a, it was just something that we're like that you know that seems to work right i mean and so people have settled on you could use the same amount of pmb as you do smb in your brewing and, and it's you're going to be fine if you are consistently using say half a gram i mean you will be overshooting the ultimate sulfite ppm you'll be over 10 ppm in five gallons no doubt, but you'll probably be safe. It's not going to, you know, you, it's still way lower than what you would add for uh, sterilization purposes. Now, yeah. w what is, in terms of sodium versus potassium metabisulfite, what might, uh, what do we know is going to be different about what happens when you add those to beer? When we add them to beer, you remember that we're adding the sulfite. That is going to be the chemical, like the active chemistry to remove oxygen. But we're adding sodium or we're adding potassium. And we know from our experience doing water chemistry that those will change water chemistry to some extent. Right. So we add sodium would make maybe the beer taste saltier. You know, there would be the, this saltiness to it if you added enough. And similarly, if you added potassium, that's going to change. I mean, like, you know, those are constituent things. And when you add table salt to a beer for changing the alkalinity or or the flavor content or or, or when you add potassium and other, and other salts, right? So again, we're adding so little, the impact should be negligible, right? Because we're adding so little to the final water makeup, you know, 10 ppm of the sulfur is there's a lot of there's many more sulfur molecules attached to each gram, so to speak, or each, you know, each um, molecule of SMB or PMB. So right. you would expect just based on the numbers to not have a big impact, but we wanted to evaluate that in this in this case. So I I would certainly expect that. Uh, but if you go look around, I actually did a Google search for something like should I use SMB or PMB for my beer? You know, something like that. I just wanted to get an idea of what is being talked about on all the forums and such out there. It is widely recommended that people use potassium metabisulfite over uh, sodium metabisulfite for this purpose because of the idea that that sodium that little bit of sodium that's that that 
remnant that that's left over after you after it scrubs the oxygen out of your beer could potentially impact the overall character of your beer. I just personally would think that the amount left over is so minuscule that it, that it really doesn't. But that was the whole idea behind why we wanted to test it out. Now, you know, it, the the the. Again, my my thing is the the this, I get that sodium has a low flavor threshold. We know that you don't have to add much to anything to actually taste the impact of the sodium. Uh, but potassium is much higher. Uh, the flavor threshold on potassium is much higher. In fact, I'm not sure people can even describe the flavor of potassium other than metallic if it's too high, right? Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah, that's not something you're gonna necessarily taste on a normal daily basis, right? Now there's potassium in bananas, but yeah. I'm not saying if you taste like bananas, so. <laughs> exactly. Or or that bananas taste like metal, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. All right, I think the last thing we should probably talk about in terms of uh, considerations when using sulfites. First off, we already mentioned there are people out there who are allergic to this stuff. So you know, and and I, I believe basically what happens to these folks who have a sulfite allergy is that it's almost like uh, uh, an asthmatic response. They it makes breathing difficult. It can be a really really crappy experience. So if you're using this stuff, be mindful of it. Let the people who are drinking your beer know that, yeah, I did use sulfites. I, I, I think mo- like a good majority of people don't care because they, they don't have that allergy. But in case somebody does, it's probably a good idea to let them know. Now, I did hear from somebody. I brought this up with somebody a while back uh, who said that when you're using sulfites for scrubbing oxygen, one, the, the amount is so low that there's really none left in the beer afterwards because it was already uh, that redox reaction. All it did was leave a sodium or a potassium ion and that's it. So the Sulfites don't actually, uh, it's no longer in that form, right? Because it, it was it was used, basically. So that's just an idea to keep in mind as well. But let people know, uh, you know, if, if it's just a nice yeah. thing to do. Now, I think the biggest consideration for me when using sulfites has to do with the style of beer that you're making. And the two types of beers that I can think of, uh, well, two general types of beers that I can think of where I think it's very, very useful obviously is IPA, particularly that of the hazy mm-hmm. sort, uh, and then pale lager. Because with pale lagers, uh, oxidation doesn't seem to have as detrimental of an impact. You can still make a decent pale lager. Slightly oxidized isn't going to ruin the beer necessarily. But when there's no oxygen, no oxidation whatsoever, it really does uh, maintain that fresh malt character uh, a lot longer in my experience. Uh, 100% on both, both cases because you see so many times people make a hazy IPA and they use all the expensive hops, they do everything correctly, and then the beer turns basically brown in the yeah. keg. Yeah. Right? This is a great place where you're maybe you're still working on your kegging process, you haven't dialed everything in, and you're having these issues like, why is my beer turning out this way? It just tastes bad afterwards. It's basically turned to a stout after a few <laughs> days in the keg. You know, what do I do? And this is a great way to do it. And then for lagers, you know, we've mentioned that the Lodo Brewing, which is lager, which is fairly lager focused, yeah. is looking at that. I have not, you know, had like you've said, I've not had nearly the same impact of oxygen on my lagers as I had in my like hate, my IPAs, hazy IPAs, that kind oh, of thing. Yeah. But hey, what 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 can it hurt, right? Especially what we're talking here in this in this specific experiment, even you know, what can it do? And we want to know more. And so these are great, uh, two great examples. And then don't be limited in which styles you pick. There are obviously styles that are a little more easy on oxygen than others. But in the end, beer. It's one of its biggest enemies is oxygen. So why not give this a shot if it works for your process? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and I was actually uh, uh, watching a really interesting YouTube video uh, on on using sodium metabisulfite in general in brewing. I think it was called, G- the, the channel's called Genus Brewing or something like that. They were talking about using it in the mash and, and all of these other reasons. And one of the comments he made was that when you use it in the mash, it can actually uh, like emulate certain characteristics that you would get from more traditional brewing practices. For example, like decoction which I had never even thought of. And if that's the case, uh, I mean, I, that definitely opens up a whole avenue of experiments for us. Uh, but if that's the case, that I mean, just another thing to add on uh, reasons to buy some p- uh, potassium metabisulfite or sodium metabisulfite. Now, I'm one of those weirdos who keeps bulk SMB and PNB on, ha- on hand. Uh, and I've used both quite a lot in my brewing, though it's mostly for making cider. While I haven't done any side-by-side comparison, I, can, I can't say that I've noticed any difference at all between sodium and potassium metabisulfite, again, which I've used both for the, the sterilization purposes. Uh, and that's that's using much larger amounts, uh, again, uh, to, to halt yeast activity. Still, there are those who believe the small amount of sodium left in beer dosed with SMB uh, to reduce oxidation is enough to have a perceptible impact. So we decided to have a look for ourselves. Results from that experiment when we're back from this break.
Family-owned Atlantic Brew Supply is the largest homebrew shop in the Southeast. No gimmicks, no multinational corporate overlords, and no BS. They offer exclusive malts, yeast, and more from local artisans, as well as award-winning recipe kits. They also sell professional brewing gear and cask equipment from sister companies ABS Commercial and Cask Supply. Most ingredients are available by the ounce, plus Atlantic Brew Supply has an on-site calculator to help you craft your best brew. Orders are processed same day, and two-day shipping is guaranteed for East Coast customers. Get 15% off your first order using promo code. Brewpod. That's B R U P O D at AtlanticBrewSupply.com. After a long brew day, the last thing I want to do is waste more time chilling wort. I've tried so many different options, and ultimately I settled on the super efficient immersion chillers made by Jaded Brewing. With the King Cobra and Hydra, I'm able to chill my entire batch of wort from boiling to just a few degrees above groundwater temperature in as little as six minutes. If an immersion chiller is right for your brewery, then do yourself a favor and check out all of the rad options Jaded Brewing has to offer at jadedbrewing.com. And be sure to let them know Brewlosophy sent you. Craftmaster Growlers takes traveling with and sharing beer to a new level. Made from heavy-duty stainless steel, Craftmaster Growlers are double-wall insulated and can keep beer cold for up to eight hours. Unlike typical growlers, Craftmaster Growlers come with a swiveling tap and fully integrated CO2 regulator cap, allowing beer to stay fresh for two weeks or more. The square design takes up less space and will fit in most refrigerator doors, and every Craftmaster Growler comes with a one-year warranty. There are 64 and 128-ounce versions available over at CraftmasterGrowlers.com. In my opinion, some of the most fascinating experiments that we've performed have been on using sulfites to reduce the risk of cold site oxidation, largely because it really does seem to work. Uh, while many view sodium and potassium beta bisulfite as being interchangeable, some feel they contribute their own perceptible characteristics to beer, which is exactly what you tested out in a recent experiment, Andy. Yeah, so let's compare the two and see if there's a significant result. So I wanted to do this for a lager. I felt this was a good example. Something crisp, clean, light. Any flaws should be pretty apparent. Any differences should be apparent. So this is a style I wanted to pick. So what, do I, what how did I go about this? I did two five-gallon batches of German Hellas export beer on the Bruzilla all-electric brew systems, two five-gallon batches, 98% Pilsner malt and 2% biscuit malt. Sounds like a good, uh, to me, nice and simple. And this is one of those styles, I again... You got hazy IPA and you got your pale lager. Those are the two main ones I think of when I think about using sulfites to reduce oxidation. German Hellas Export Beer being a slightly stronger beer also has a little bit a little bit more hops. Uh, to me, a perfect example. It would really display if there was any impact between... Again, we're not looking at the, the oxidation uh, s- s- or oxygen scavenging uh, portion of this. We are looking to see purely if sodium metabisulfite or potassium metabisulfite contribute unique uh, flavor, perceptible characteristics to beer. So good call. Cool. So simple brewing process, very straightforward. We just did a single infusion mash for both batches at 150 Fahrenheit or 66 degrees Celsius. When the mashes were complete, I removed the grains and sparge to collect identical pre volume volumes of wort. Uh, both worts Boiled for a simple 60 minutes. We did. I did 23 grams of Centennial hops at 60 minutes for bittering, and then 28 grams of Technang at 15 minutes. After the boil, worts were chilled and racked to sanitize Delta firm tanks, at which point the refractometer readings were taken, and both batches were the same at a clean 1.055 OG. Which is perfect. You'd expect that. Both of these beers were treated exactly identically uh, up until this point. And so this just, to me, Andy, this is just proof of your brewing consistency. So very well done, my friend. I... I may have done a few batches in my life. So yeah, so I should be no, I should <laughs> yeah, dial, dial a few hundreds, so, I'm sure. Yeah. Something on that order of hundreds. So fill the fermenters, put them into a temperature controlled chamber at 50 degrees Fahrenheit or 10 degrees Celsius. Let them cool down there a little bit warm. Sometimes the chiller doesn't go all the way to 50. So, you know, around 50, wait for that 50 degrees <laughs> to come down. Yeah. In Southern California, you, it's a struggle, right? Yeah. Hmm. It can be a struggle sometimes, at which point I added a starter of Imperial L17 Harvest evenly split between them. I like to just build a starter for lager just because we're cold. We need a few more cells, even though that the packs, of course, and Marshall knows this, the packs of Imperial are so many cells that you can almost yeah. always do one pack. But I just like to take a little more precaution. So after a week of fermentation, I raised the temperature to 55 degrees Fahrenheit or 13 degrees Celsius and left it for about two more weeks before I took hydrometer measurements of both batches to show that they reached the same finishing gravity of 1.0. Oh, eight. In the ver- preparation for the variable, I uh, weighed out equal uh, different uh, equal ppm's or slightly different amounts, different masses of SMB and PMB to achieve ten ppm of sulfites in each batch. So, based on calculations using the 
molar weights of these molecules, uh, you need 0.28 grams of SMB or 0.33 grams of PMB. These were added individually to two CO2 purge kegs, and then before they were beer was pressure transferred into them. In this case, I did purge the kegs prior. Yeah, let's talk about that for a minute. Uh, the, again, the purpose of this was not to see it, whether SMB versus PMB has better, you know, oxygen scavenging properties. That's not the purpose of this experiment. We what we were very interested in is whether or not you could taste the sodium or the potassium, I guess, uh, from either of these sources of sulfite. And so, p- by purging ahead of time, uh, you, you, I mean, you're you're still going to introduce a little bit of oxygen. And again, given the small amounts of SMB, I mean, 028 grams, you have to have a pretty fine, uh, a pretty fine scale to be, to be able to even accomplish uh, that amount, you know, um, by adding that you're still, it's still going to do its oxygen scavenging. It's still going to do all of that stuff. But again, mm-hmm. we're not, we're not looking for whether, you know, whether or not it uh, is reducing the cold side oxidation. We're just looking for the flavor difference. So I think pre-purging because that's a normal part of your process already is perfectly valid. Yep. So just a part of my process, just folding this in, not wanting to change stuff. Kind of how we want to do experiments or how I approach them, at least, is to leave as much of the thing, my process the same. We're just adding variables just to those parts of those processes to see what happens. So Andy, a question then. When you, uh, when you do that, when you're pre-purging like that and then adding the sulfites back or the, the SMB or PMB, how are you doing that after you've purged the keg already? Are you just yeah. trying to be really safe and gentle when you like, take the lid off? Or Yep. Yep, exactly. So there's just kind of a... you know we. There's so many things you can do. There's and then there's so much that it would be uh, laborious to do. So I made it very simple. Um, what we did was I, what I did was when I'm ready with the kegs that are empty, right? They're empty but purged with CO2. Is that I open the lids and I add the 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 the, the the uh, powder. Sometimes I, I do in this case, I did mix it with a little bit of water just to make sure it was completely broken up and put in, but uh-huh. it goes in there and then I s- seal the keg again and then purge the top of CO2. So the hope being is that that little bit of CO, uh, oxygen egress, the, the opening the lid yeah. is per, yeah, I did purge, you know, pump, you know, add CO2 purge, add CO2 purge. And I did it both at the same time, you know, trying to keep everything yeah. identical between the two, right? It's, it's not so much about minimizing O2. It's about doing the same thing to both batches to see if right. there's a difference. Right. Totally. Okay, cool. Yeah. So after the kegs were filled, I place them in a keyser where they're allowed to condition for about three weeks before they're ready for evaluation. So carbonated, car, uh, you know, carbonated, conditioned, and ready to serve. So on to the serving. So objective appearances, they looked identical. I could not tell a difference. Just nice, nice, crisp, clean. Uh, you know, almost you could read a newspaper through it. Not super bright, but you know, pretty bright uh, by the pictures. And then we wanted to do into triangle tests. So I did both in my internal one where I do it myself, where I'm obviously not completely blind to the variable, but I am blind to the beers being served. And then we also did it for the real triangle test. So out of my personal impressions, out of five semi-blind triangle tests, I was correct only once. <laughs> that is not very consistent. <laughs> that, no. I mean, that, that would indicate that there was, you know, and you got to keep this in mind. We, when we serve these beers to the triangle test or to the participants, uh, they are completely blind, meaning they usually don't even know the style, though we're, we're, you know, we'll let people know the style. It's pretty easy to tell if it's an IPA or a stout. Uh, but but they have no idea what the variable is. And so when they're going into it, they've got a whole multitude of factors spinning through their head and they're thinking, man, what could it possibly be? If they're brewers, they might be wondering if we did a firm, you know, a firm temp uh, experiment or if it was, a, you know exactly what you did. And I would contend you kind of knew what to expect because you know what salt tastes like. Uh, and, and so if there is a difference, you of all people should be able to tell, tell it, you know, be able to tell the odd beer out in the, in your own triangle test attempts. And yet you only did it one time, which is even worse than chance. I mean, that just indicates you were completely <laughs> guessing the whole time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Guessing the entire time for this one. So moving on to uh, really the meat and potatoes of this, we, who, who testing with other people that have no idea what the variable is. I was able to find 23 participants for this experiment. They were served uh, in three uh, different colored cups, two beers were the same one is different. They have to pick the odd beer out. So 23 participants, for significance, in this case, we would need 12 people to be correct. And in actuality, we got six people to be correct, which was not significant. <laughs> That's very not significant, kind of like your triangle test attempts. That's only 26% of tasters. Randomness is 33% in a triangle test. Triangle is three points, right? So uh, you would expect out of you know 23 people, about one third of them, which would be about you know around eight, seven or eight, would uh, just randomly guess the odd beer out. And in this case, it was just six people. Again, that says nothing other than these beers were largely indistinguishable by this panel of tasters. 
and I would contend, and we are not saying this, you know, that it's like some principle now, but I would contend, you know, implications wise, that if you are struggling to, to decide whether to use SMB or PMB for the purposes of reducing the risk of cold side oxidation, you probably don't have to stress about it. You can go with whatever's cheaper. Now, in my brewing, given the, given the higher concentration of sulfites in sodium metabisulfite and the fact that SMB and PMB are about the same price, which is very cheap, I'm kind of inclined to just stick with using SMB because you don't need to add as much, right? Um, and that's, again, that's my own personal opinion. If you've got two pounds of potassium metabisulfite on hand and you want to start using it for this, by all means, do that, you know? Yeah, I agree. It doesn't appear to be any difference, right? So first of all, let's break it down. Both had sodium or had had metabisulfites in them, right? So that's not the comparison. It's which is which can you taste more or different, right? We do we did reduce the oxygen. We added this. We reduced the oxygen. Now it be you know we've done other experiments where we've not added or added different times, and there's other places to add it. But in the end, it was there. There was not an impact here. You know we would have expected at a minimum a flavor impact that wasn't actually even addressed. So. Um, yeah, I feel, I feel very comfortable using either. Honestly, I think I'm just going to be more inclined to use sulfites in brewing more. I think it's, it <laughs> serves a useful purpose at all stages of the brewing process. It's yeah. just it's just easy to use and it's very cheap. So why not? Yeah, that's kind of how I'm thinking. Now, I would be very curious to see a similar comparison um, when larger amounts are used to halt yeast activity prior to back sweetening a cider. We'll do a cider experiment, very simple store bought cider, but then use SMB versus PMB uh, prior to back sweetening. Because you are using, uh, I, I believe it's actually about a half a teaspoon, um, which I think is on the order of three or four grams or something like that. So it is, a, it is massive amounts more, you know, relative that tiny whisper that you use for cold side oxidation in beer. It's quite a bit more and you know in my experience cider is a good uh, kind of a good backdrop for accentuating differences it's very simple it's clean uh, there's not much else in the way other than a little bit of apple flavor you know um, that'd be a really that'd be a really neat one because I do have to imagine that at some point there is a threshold to where the salty or the the sodium from the SMB does impart maybe more and maybe it accentuates apple flavor in cider or something you know we use salt all the time to accentuate the flavor of food it would make sense to me if at, at some point Again, you reach this threshold to where you can distinguish the sodium from the potassium, that remnant sodium or potassium in whatever you're using. It just seems that, you know, at least based on this experiment, uh, along with massive amounts of anecdotal experience and reports out there, uh, that SMB and PMB when used for oxygen scavenging to reduce cold side oxidation does not seem to matter. Uh, that you're going to get the same uh, result in the end without much of a flavor impact, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah, and I love the idea of using it in cider, and especially for that that case of sodium as a flavor as a flavor additive, because we like you said, so salt use table salt all the time. Be very interesting that, and and you're using you know so much man grams, you're gonna break the bank, Marshall. I don't know if I can afford all this sodium metabisulfite. <laughs> yeah, I, I've had the same one pound bag of PMB, and then I have a one pound bag of, of SMB as well. I've had them for about six years, and they you wouldn't think that they've been, they've been used. We'll put it that way. So, well, we got a couple of reader comments to get to. The first one comes from Lawrence Prantner, who says I. Use use SMB all the time. It works for me. I like to mix it in with a gelatin and pour it in each keg at packaging. I think that's a cool idea. Oh, that's that's a perfect time to add it because you already opened the keg once. You're going to limit oxidation. Just yeah. mix all together and boom, you had a great great time to add it and it's simple. You're not going to forget it. You just add them at the same time. Great idea. Plus, you're going to have a clearer beer because that gelatin works works you know magic in my opinion uh, to clarify beer. Now, I do think it's kind of funny. It's almost uh, like hedonistic that he's adding uh, sulfite and gelatin, two things that there are people out there who adamantly hate being used in beers. <laughs> so I'm cool with both, you know, but, but you do might you might want to let your vegetarian and your sulfite uh, allergy friends know that you're using <laughs> those if you're planning on doing that. My one thing that this, one thing that Lawrence said that uh, I thought was interesting is, um, or, or I guess about what he said that I, that I wondered about is that when I, I don't know, I'm not smart enough to know how long it takes for the sulfite to do the oxygen scavenging. I've heard it's pretty quick though. It's a fairly rapid process. So if you're adding the sulfites to the gel, Gelatin, like, is it going to scavenge the oxygen from that and then kind of be done and putter out and then you add it to the beer? You know, I, I, I don't know about that kind of stuff. My guess is that it takes longer than the, the three seconds between, you know, mixing it into your hot gelatin solution and, and adding that to your beer. But just something that I wondered. I don't know. 
Well, well, you know, to, to that point, you know, if you boil the water ahead of uh, the gelatin, I know you're not supposed to add boiling water gelatin, but if you boil the water ahead of time, you're going to remove most of the oxygen from it anyways, right? So yeah, I point. would say you're okay. And I would just be, qu- be, I'd just be quick about it. I wouldn't be uh, letting things sit. That would be the problem. So yeah, yeah. Uh, final comment comes from Mark Stolowski, who says, I've read that ascorbic acid, vitamin C, can also be used to prevent oxidation without having the issue with people sensitive to sulfites. Uh, any chance of an experiment with that? I just want to comment real quick, Mark, and I'm curious what your thoughts are on ascorbic acid, Andy, mm-hmm. uh, that ascorbic acid does scrub oxygen. It's noted to do that. Uh, but in the little research that I've done on its use uh, to reduce CSO, a uh, cold side oxidation at packaging, apparently it can actually promote oxidation when used in the absence of sulfites. Now, I'm not understand of the, the, the mechanics behind that. I don't, I don't understand how that works, but there should be enough residual sulfites from the grain uh, so that, that the lack of sulfites, uh, you know, that, that, that there's not an utter absence, basically. Uh, and those, that minimal amount of sulfites that you actually come from the grain in the beer should be enough to allow the ascorbic acid to work. But uh, yeah, I, I would definitely like to run a few experiments using ascorbic acid for these purposes as well. Yeah, I think I need to definitely read up on it, especially in food stuff, because a lot of times when you see uh, packaged juices or anything on the shelf that's usually stored cold, they add they add back uh, vitamin C or ascorbic acid. So I'd be very curious to read more about it just to see how we would end up processing it in beer. Yeah, it's certainly something that is out there. I know a lot of brewers. Uh, I mean, I I, it's, I don't know personally a lot of brewers, but I'm aware that there are, are quite a few brewers out there that have been, uh, you know, integrating ascorbic acid into their brewing uh, for these reasons to reduce cold side oxidation. It's another one I feel like uh, I've heard talked about using it in the mash as well, uh, that you are not adding sulfites. So, you know, again, uh, you know, like Mark said, people who are sensitive to sulfites don't have to worry about it. And if it and if it does the same thing as, you know, PMB or SMB, then why not? I mean, it's equally as cheap. I would, I would buy it as well, <laughs> you know, and use that instead. Just again, just to reduce the chances that somebody gets, you know, gets sick off of what I'm, what I'm brewing, but cool <laughs> idea, Mark. I know we've, we've actually tossed around ideas, uh, for, for integrating some, uh, some ascorbic acid experiments and that is going to happen in the future. So, uh, thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, Andy, that is all I've got on SMB versus PMB when used at kegging. How about you, man? No, this is a great uh, experiment to just test them a little, really dig, or dig deeper into sulfites and especially use in brewing and in the use of removing oxygen. I think it's just another data point to add to your cadre of uh, analyses that you're doing on sulfites. We're going to keep going. And there's other uh, food products like this that are uh, oxygen reducing. And that's kind of the goal of this was to reduce oxygen without changing the beer at all, or at least minimizing its impact. So I'm excited to keep using them, try to keep exploring it. And I think everyone wants to hear more about it. So we're going to keep moving ahead with it. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And don't be afraid of sulfites fights unless you have an allergy. I, I, have a, I have a little bit of a story I, I kind of held off to the end to tell. Uh, when I first got my, my the first bag of sulfite I ever bought came in the form of potassium metabisulfite. And it was because of all the talk that I heard from people with, you know, oh, the sodium could impact the flavor of your cider or your beer. Um, I opened that up and just that little wisp, you know, when you open up a bag, like a zip top bag, it is that little wisp of powder that came up. I, 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 I started having asthmatic reaction to it. Uh, I've never experienced that before. Oh, I was coughing. My, I, my was wheezing. My, my wife had to ask me, why are you wheezing? Why are your eyes all red? Um, so it is, it is powerful stuff and it has a very, very strong chemical smell. You will notice that when you mix it with water, it turns into uh, that sulfur dioxide, which smells like, you know, my, my dog's farts basically. Uh, you, so it's a very interesting chemical, but be careful if you're using this stuff. Um, I, I say that because I it would seem that I may have a, a at least a minor allergy to sulfites, and yet I still use it without issue, without problems whatsoever uh, in higher amounts in my cider, and then I've used it a few times as an antioxidant in my beer, and I have zero issues. So don't be afraid of the stuff. Just mind it. Just know that you're working with something that can be, uh, that can be I guess you could say, you know, uh, 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 risky for other people to consume. So just let them know. You don't want to throw, any, throw anybody into an asthmatic, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, experience <laughs> yeah. there because of something you brew. But well, don't forget to subscribe to the Brew Lab podcast, where host Kate Job takes you into the lab with real brewing scientists to discuss fascinating research they've done on our favorite beverage. And as always, you can read more about the experiment we discussed by clicking the link to the article on brewlosophy.com in the description of this episode. The Brewlosophy podcast is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors as well as all of our rad listeners. We seriously could not do this without you. Cheers to everyone who has subscribed and left a review of our show. It makes a huge difference. If you haven't yet, please consider doing so. Head over to brewlosophy.com slash support to view a list of ways you can easily help us to continue producing this podcast. If you want a reward for your support, visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Brewlosophy podcast. Until then, think beer. Start off
the morning with some hot tea, lemon and honey, cause it suits my bro. Put some herb in the bowl, yeah, it's homegrown. Ain't gotta go through the middle man no more.